There are 52 commanders in Outlaws of Thunder Junction, and we ranked every single one of them from least powerful to most powerful. I'm Mia, and I'd really like it if Amber joined us. I'm BZ, yeehaw, and we're the Nitpicking Nerds, sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can yee until your last haw at Card Kingdom with their plethora of card selections. I got excited about saying yeehaw, and then I lost it. However, Card Kingdom's amazing. As you can tell, BZ changed the sign to Yeehaw, but if you want other Yeehaw outlaws at Thunder Junction and whatever, you can get it all at Card Kingdom, whether that's singles from the set or sealed or commander decks or just a little bit of whatever. They have it all. Also, Dragon Shield, best sleeves in the multiverse. Yeehaw. If you want to get your Dragon Shield sleeves with the sleeve crafter or the mats or whatever you really like, you can save 5% with the code Ye Nerds. Nerds. Close enough. Code. Close enough. And that would be really awesome because you'd be supporting the channel and and just getting yourself some discounted sleeves at the same time. Supporting the channel? You mean like how Moxfield supports us with a sponsorship because we read their ads in the middle of the video without anyone being able to guess where it is? They cannot guess where it is. Support the channel? You mean like the patrons who help make this possible by making this our full-time job? We're both officially full-time and we love you guys and you're amazing and you can get cool perks by joining the Patreon? That Patreon? Yes, you can get deck audits there. You can watch some Commander gameplay from us with some fun, uh, like, amazing guests. We had Jake and Joel last month, so go check it out. And if you even want, there's a certain tier where you can get 30 minutes a month one-on-one -on -one with us. So now that Amber has joined us, we are going to be ranking every commander from Outlaws of Thunder Junction from worst to best, but only in terms of power. Our former ranking scale is not going to factor in this time. This is only based on power. You're going to get the full power scale experience, and we are going to make fun of the worst ones and praise the best ones. But you said power a lot there, but this is a fully power only type deal. We are not updating the spreadsheet either. So let's start with the worst one, 52. Miriam, Herd Whisperer, green and a white for a 3-2. As long as it's your turn, mounts and vehicles you control have hexproof. Whenever a mount or vehicle you control attacks, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. There's a lot to digest there, but it all kind of boils down to, eh, I, I mean, it's only it only matters on your turn that they have hexproof. And it only when it attacks, you only get one 1-1 one, one counter on it if she's out. This, I think that's pretty weak. This is a Vehicles Mounts Commander, but I think it was more designed for a limited because there's a cycle of Uncommon Legends, and I don't think this really has any legs in Commander at all. kind of just seems like a complete you know, whiff in terms of commander power. Not every legendary creature needs to be designed for, designed for commander, and this is an example of that, so we're just going to move on to number 51, Vadmir. New blood. One a black for a 2-2. Whenever you commit a crime, put a plus one plus one counter on Vadmir, but only once each turn, and a crime, again, is targeting opponents, anything they control, and or cards in their graveyards, and as long as he has four or more plus one counters on him, he has menace and lifelink. So you got to commit four crimes, most likely, or, you know, augment his power four times, and then he's like, a pretty decent beater if you can chunk in with them. I just, I mean, while it is kind of easy to commit crimes, I just don't think this is the payoff anyone's looking for. Like, I'm not even sure if I'd really love having, like, a one black for a 6-6 six, six with, like, life link and menace. Like, sure, um, I guess. On suspend. Yeah, so it's fu that's fine, I guess. But I feel like that takes a really long time. And then after that, it's like, so what now? And it's like, uh? It's also really limited by the only once each turn. Yeah, you can do it in one full turn cycle if you can do something on each opponent's turn and yours, but that's still way longer than I want to wait with this. Yeah, we're kind of doing Voltron stuff. And, you know, I'm thinking of some of the easier crimes to commit, like Blood Artist. That's not really Voltron. That's like an Aristocrats deck. And Aristocrats doesn't really care about just having a big 6-6 six -six or a 10-10 ten -ten or something. So good luck, Vadmir builders out there. I think you got a lot of work ahead of you. We're going to go to number 50. What is number 50? Number 50 is Fortune Loyal Steed. Tune away for a 2-4 when it ETBs Scry 2. When it attacks while saddled at the end of combat, exile it and up to one creature that saddled it this turn, then return those cards to the battlefield under their owner's control and has saddle 1, which means a creature with power 1 or greater can be tapped and then you can saddle it which is kind of you know just like crew with vehicles this is i don't want to be attacking and saddling things and also flickering things in the same deck that's just like a lot of mishmash that i don't want to be doing this is one of the legends in the set that doesn't really need to be your commander we are only evaluating these as commander which is why fortune is so low mono white blink is already like who's doing that and it also requires fortune to be able to attack and it can't attack the turn it comes out and then you also need to crew it saddle it with another creature and it only flickers that creature so i just feel like it is it is a little slow. It just doesn't do what you need to do. Yeah, I'm not really big about this because I think if the effect of it coming back down was a little bit better, I would be. But it's just 
Scry 2, and then you have to go through all this like rigmarole just to get to Scry 2. We could just put cards in our decks and play commanders that help with that a little bit better. Next up, number 49, Eartha Joe, Frontier Mentor, 2 white red for a 2-4 ETV, you make a mercenary. I'm not going to read mercenaries, you get it's on the screen. Uh, whenever you activate an ability that targets a creature or player, copy that ability, you can choose new targets for the copy. So this is pretty cool, actually. It's an underpowered commander because the mercenary is kind of whatever, but it is two bodies for four mana. I think it's really cool. I just don't think there's enough here yet for activated abilities that target stuff to be copied. There's a couple of cool ones, and I think it, it falls off really fast. You know, you it's end just, up getting to like giant killer and stuff. I'm not really big on this. I don't think there are a lot of activated abilities in Boros that are like really where I want to be with this card. It has to be an activated ability that also targets, and then maybe you can choose new targets for the copy. It's not the greatest i'd say yeah it really doesn't jump off the page there's just in like five years you know eartha might have a lot of stuff going but for now it's just a cool idea that is going to have a few stinkers in the deck i think how about number 48 number 48 lazav familiar stranger please stop printing lazav if you're not going to make him cool one blue black for a one four when you commit a crime you put a one one counter on him then you can exile a card from a graveyard if a creature card was exiled this way he can become a copy of it until end of turn but only once each turn this limits itself. Usually committing crimes is a limiter itself, but this doesn't on his face. However, you have to exile the card from your graveyard, which means that already limits it, and then you can only have him become a copy of a creature once per turn, which is another limiter. We don't need any of these limiters because he's already not that cool. I don't know how we're supposed to get anything consistent going. I mean, we can choose stuff from their graveyard, but odds are stuff in our graveyard is going to be better and more suited. Like, you know, we want Phyrexian Dreadnoughts in our graveyard because then Lazav is big and he can hit for commander damage. But there's just nothing here that is like, oh, I've never seen that before. This is Lazav's fourth card. And what do the other three do? Basically this. So I'm just going to go to number 47, Ty Joaquin, Perfect Shot. White, red for a 2-3. Now this is one I have not seen before. Whenever a source you control deals non-combat damage to a creature equal to that creature's toughness, draw a card. And X, tap if a source you control would deal non-combat damage to a permanent or a player this turn. It deals that much damage plus X. There's a couple things going on. Let's say your opponent has a 2-3. If you lightning strike it and deal 3 to it, you draw a card because it deals exactly enough damage to kill it. That's what you gotta look out for. And then if you have like a burn spell that would hit for 4, but they have a 5 toughness creature, Ty Joaquin can increase it by 1 so that you would draw a card. Or, if you have like a end the festivities, you can use Ty Joaquin to turn it into a board wipe by adding like 5 or 6 damage. I feel like you have to keep up like track of so much stuff with Ty Joaquin. You have to be like, okay, well I can't put Blasphemous Act in unless I can buff everyone's creature to 13 to get, you so, can't. so you can't. And then it's like, oh, but if there are Anthems, I have to keep track of those. And then also it's a lot of mana to pay into her if you do need to deal some extra damage. And then, oh, if they have combat tricks somehow, you know, suddenly it's like, ooh, well maybe my commander does nothing. I feel like this could be really cool if it was like equal to that creature's toughness plus a little bit more or something. Something. like if there was a little bit more than just equal to it because that's so specific most people aren't playing like just a board of one ones or two twos and i think it'll be really hard to get multiple triggers off of this while still like building a very cohesive and synergistic deck that can win on time yeah it's pretty janky but i do like the idea of you know one direction you could take with this deck is to give away a bunch of one ones specifically and then play a bunch of end the festivities effects to kill them all like with uh you know, what's the spirit? Uh, Forbidden Orchard, the spirit yeah, maker, that, that kind of thing. But Evelyn Offering, you know, there could be something here. I kind of like Ty Joaquin, but it is kind of janky. Number 46, Calamity, Galloping Inferno, 4 red red for a 4-6 haste. It's got Saddle 1, and when it attacks, you do that classic red thing where you copy a creature that's not legendary, and then it goes away at the end of the turn, and it's tapped and attacking. I just, like, 6 mana on this creature feels very bad what is over costed for what it does yeah i just think that for this effect even though it does have haste i don't want to be paying six mana for this and then if it gets swords once or something it's just like okay that's eight mana in a mono red deck Ugh. yeah i don't i just don't know what this does you know I, there's a little bit of inherent power to if you get this down you can copy a thing that's that's saddling it but also if it's like a big attacker it has to saddle so you can't attack with the thing because it's tapped and it's saddled. 
Ultimately, I think Calamity is a little bit better than the cards we talked about before, but it is definitely less interesting. I hate the fact that they come in tapped and attacking, and then it just gets sacrificed immediately. If it, you had a little bit more time, or if it came in not tapped but attacking, I think you might be able to have a little bit more synergy, but then it has to be non-legendary, and then also has to be worth coming in, and I don't want to be doing that. Yeah, are we done with this with the Red Commanders? Just play Kiki Jiki <laughs> or Rihanna or Jaxus. Play any of those, they're much more fun. Cranko Mob Boss, even? I don't know about that one, <laughs> but you can make 1-1 Goblins with Cranko Mob Boss. Awesome. Number 45, Ariat the Beguiler. One white, blue, and a black for a 4 4 with lifelink. Whenever an aura you control becomes attached to a non land permanent and opponent controls with mana value less than or equal to the aura's mana value, gain control of the permanent for as long as the aura is attached to it. So you want to be playing like Esper auras, but then also high costed that ones, or at least ones that are more costed than your opponent's creatures, but then the creatures have to be worth stealing, and that's a lot of hoops to jump through. This is a flavorful card. I get what's going on. You know, she's putting them to sleep with the aura, and then she's taking control of them, and they're like sleepwalking or something like that. I just think you got to play expensive auras because you want to make sure the net you're casting to gain control of creatures is wide, because I can't gain control of a five mana value creature unless I have a five mana value aura. And so this just looks like a hard deck to build. I don't exactly know, as I bump my mic, what to do with this. I, I feel like it's already a little bit of a dubious card. I'm not sure. Yeah, and the fact that you, it's not like you have access to green. So I feel like this is one of those decks that's going to be like draw go for the first like three or four turns, maybe throwing out like a mana rock or something. And then it's like, okay, guys, I put out area. Here we go. Now I can start casting auras to put on other people's stuff. And then like you know, in response or something, she, like, gets sniped if you try and, like, buff someone's, like, creature or something. That's the other problem with Ariat is there's... The, what's the backup plan? There's no cards that are really like this, so I feel like you're you're all in on Ariat, and then if she dies, it's kind of a disaster because you're giving away creatures that you buffed with auras because we're not going to... I'm not going to take a creature I put a pacifism on. I don't think that's what we want to do. So your creatures that you give away then give back to their owners all have buffs on them, and it's just a little... I, it's just not for me, that's for sure. No. It's not for me. I don't think it's that good. This is all or nothing on area, and I don't like being dead in the water like that, because I feel like this is going to be a very high target commander. Yep, let's go to number 44, Gem Lightfoot Sky Explorer. Two white, blue for a flying vigilance, 3-3. Three, three. At the beginning of your end step, if you hadn't cast a spell from your hand this turn, you draw a card. So this is the Drago Lady. There's not much here. She just wants you to play a bunch of instants, flash cards. You know, Final Showdown probably goes in this deck uh, very nicely. Ultimately... Four mana, three three. That makes you the monarch, but you can't cast spells during your turn. It's a, it's pretty low. But I don't think this card's bad. I don't think it's bad either. I mean, I guess you could do something really weird if you had like cascade type deals or plot type deals because it just says having cast a spell from your hand. It doesn't say that you have to be playing like Azorius Control. But that seems like the easiest way to build this, and I think that's a little stinky. Yeah, some cards like you know, like pretty much everything that gives something cascade or has cascade has to be cast from your hand anyway. So like foretelling, you could maybe do some kind of Vega the Watcher style where you foretell and then you're maybe flashbacking. And then that could be cool. I think Gem Lightfoot is cool. There's surprisingly a decent amount to do with it. Number 43 is Jolene, Plundering Pugilist. One green red for a 4-2. Whenever you attack with one or more creatures with power, four or greater, create a treasure token. One or a red and sack a treasure, it deals one damage to any target. There's stuff to do with this one, too, though. Uncommon Legends kind of slap in this set. The first thing I think of is, like, well, I can give her Death Touch and now shoot down any creatures I want. I think that this card would not be as low on this list if there weren't so many amazing legends at the top of the list. This this list does get pretty stacked as we keep going. Jo Jolene's cool. She's a little self-contained package. You want to play Power 4 or Greater. One of the better, you know... They keep printing Uncommon Legends for Power 4 or Greater. She's one of the better ones of those that they've printed. She's much better than, like, uh, Tuya Bearclaw. Tuya Bearclaw sucks. Jolene is actually interesting, and if I saw a Jolene deck, I would respect it. I'm just happy that the the treasures aren't coming in tapped. I'm sick of seeing that. Uh, if only we will see it later. I, I Probably not, but we're going to see Moxfield right now because this is the ad for Moxfield. We actually love Moxfield. We use it for all of our decks. If you wanted to build one deck for every legend in Outlaws of Thunder Junction and associated sets, you'd have 52 decks and you could sort them in folders easily on Moxfield.com. There's no limit to how many decks you can build on Moxfield.com. It is an amazing place because we would know we have so many decks on Moxfield. We have so many folders, so many decks. Go follow us. Go check out our decks if you'd like. But we can prove to you that there is no limit. It's very, very handy. So number 42 is Lila. Undefeated Slick Shot, or Lilia? I think it's Lilia, Undefeated Slick Shot. I think it's Lilia, too. Yeah. One blue red for a 3-3 prowess. Whenever you cast a multicolored instant or sorcery spell from your hand, exile it, it becomes plotted. 
that's pretty neat. It kind of gives the spell rebound. You can you can save them and build them up, and they're not reliant on whether Lilia is in play. However, the issue here is that we are judging Lilia as a commander, and that means you can only play exactly blue-red instants or sorceries to trigger this. So the, your pool is very slim. We went ahead and checked over on EDH Rec what these decks look like, and they start scraping the bottom of the barrel like seven instants in. <laughs> <laughs> I think that like Expansion Explosion is one of the only ones I can think of off the top of my head where I'm like, yeah, you know what? That might work in this deck. And as BZ says, Lilia's name like four different ways this entire thing. Malia. There we go. I wish this was better. And it can be really cool in your 99 if you're playing like Instance and Sorceries Niv-Mizzet or something. Yeah, as long as she's got friends who have more colors in their identity than her, she's going to be a great addition to 99. As far as commanders go, I don't think anyone's really going to try to build this. Moving right up, it's 41, Tiny Bones, the Pickpocket. Black for a 1-1 with Death Touch. When it deals combat damage to a player, you can cast Target Non-Land Permanent from that player's graveyard, and mana of any type can be spent to cast that spell. I mean, it comes down really early. You can probably get a few swings in early, but how many things are really in their graveyard that early in the game? Because this would be turn two, you can like theoretically swing with him, deal one damage, then just check what they have in their graveyard. I don't even know what would be in there. I the, My first thought is maybe this encourages you to play Thoughtseize and Discard type effects, because Tiny Bones has liked that in the past, but that you're still not getting any early game value. What, are you going to Thoughtseize and Arcane Signet on turn... What turn is it? I don't even know, because you play Tiny Bones on turn one, then you only have two, two mana on turn two, so you're not going to cast anything that turn. But then turn three, maybe you thought sees an Arcane Signet, but that is, we are not getting away with murder. Tiny Bones was maybe a shock to see this low on the list as a, a Mythic Rare and a very hyped card. I think it's cute, and it's awesome, and I could totally see someone building this deck, I just do not see the power because you do have to obviously pay mana for the spell if we didn't make that abundantly clear. I think that coming down early is kind of its downfall. If you had a little bit more time to rev up to it and it had a way better effect, like you could cast it for free, but this was like a four mana thing. I think it would have legs to stand on. Or it said like you can play lands on their graveyard. Actually just caring about fetches might make it work. But because it's non-land permanent card and you can't even get instants or sorceries, which I feel like a lot of people might be casting on turns one and two, you know, your ponders and whatever, that it, uh, this just doesn't get any early game value for me. Yeah, and so we talked about not being able to really cast anything. Like, you can hit, but not really cast anything. But then once you get into the middle of the game, you can cast something because there's stuff in their graveyard, but you can't hit. So you have to give Tiny Bones evasion, and this death touch isn't really helping a lot, and then you've got to go through this trouble. And Tiny Bones, I wish you had evasion. Uh, it would definitely help, but also cost more mana, which I've never asked of a commander before, and let me cast it for free. <laughs> We're going back to an uncommon for number 40. It's Baron Bertram Greywater. Two white black for a 3-4. Whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your control, you get a 1-1 black vampire, but like everything else in this set, it only triggers once each turn, and one in a black sacrifice another creature or artifact, draw a card. That last mode kind of saves it. I don't think I'm making maximum one token per turn is something to write home about really they are they have lifelink so there is that but tacking on a stack out it makes this a functional yet very very replaceable white black sacrifice commander i am excited to put this in the 99 of edgar but as a commander standing on its own i'm this is not where i want to be with it just the ones each turn really hurts it not much else worth talking about what's number 39 number 39 is vile smasher with a cowboy hat gleeful grenadier red black for a three two whenever another outlaw etvs under your control it deals one damage to target opponent this is the i feel like you're either going to combo with this or you're just going to be real slow with outlaws yeah you can play outlaws and you know eventually ping them vile smasher does deal the damage so if you give it lifelink you got something going but i'm just thinking of like persist combos i guess Ultimately, Vile Smasher is a mediocre payoff for Outlaws that maybe has some niche combo stuff going on, but it's not even that unique to Vile Smasher. It really is. And another kind of forgettable commander, in my opinion at least, is 38, Wily Duke, a teen hero. One green white for a 4-2 with Vigilance. When it becomes tapped, you gain one life and draw a card. So this is wants you to, like, crew stuff with it or saddle things with it because it has Vigilance, and if you attack with it, it doesn't really matter. I think if you start crewing this with vehicles and you get, like, Quest for Renewal or Seedborn Muse going, that's pretty sick. It's just, like, the maximum value you can get out of that is four cards per turn cycle. That's pretty good. That's like, But that seems like the pinnacle of what this deck can do, right? Yeah, I mean, it's not bad, but when I build around a commander, I'd like it to do better than not bad and just like a, ooh, I mean, this is some value, I guess, you know? I mean, yeah, we said Seedborn Muse. If you have, if you have Seedborn Muse and you get a full rotation, draw four, gain four, not exactly the best you could do. I mean, it's a full rotation, but you need Seaborn Muse, Wily Duke, and you also need something to tap it. 
I, I'm saying, yeah, and even granted all of that, you only get yeah. four cards and Plus four Plus for life. renewal, you know, like, but then that's just like you're adding stuff in, and if you have these untapped payoffs, I'd rather be playing other commanders. Yeah, maybe there's something here. There's definitely something here. This might be one of the cooler vehicle commanders I've seen, and the white green is a nice touch for it. It's just a low impact card. The deck is probably cooler than the card is. Uh, number 37, this is a weird one, Obeka, Splitter of Seconds, one blue, black, red for a 2-5 menace, obviously. And when she deals combat damage to a player, of course you get that many additional upkeep steps after this phase. This is gonna, just like the last Obeka, there's a theme going, there's a bunch of absolute draft chaff garbage in this deck, but when Obeka is doing her thing and chugging along, you can't lose because they are now the best magic cards ever made. And I like that, but it is, it does again put a lot of pressure on Obeka to stay on the field. And uh, your deck might get a little slow after, if she's not around because you got to wait till you're upkeep for everything. I mean, this is the pinnacle of like just you wait till I untap, the, or unless you have a lot of haste enablers in here. And then you also have to have upkeep triggers. And you, this is a mishmash of a deck. And I think it's super cool. I do love the time theme around Obeka. I think that it leads to some very interesting play patterns and then also a lot of draft chaff in your deck though. But in the end, if you can't keep her on the field, she's going to get real expensive. And in Grixis, it's going to be real hard to keep her out after the first like time or two that you bring her to the field because that commander tax is going to add up. Yeah, but make sure you get a hold of your, your Xanathar, your guild kingpins. Though That's an upkeep trigger. That could help. Descent into Avernus is also an upkeep trigger. That one is probably one of the scariest ones because you start getting extra mana and then you go into your second main phase and you get to use the mana. I really do like this because it's not like Sphinx of the Second Sun where it's like at the end of your post-combat main phase you get additional one because you can't cast sorcerers after that. I know, read Don't it. Don't bring up that card. It's, it's... I know, read that. But uh, you can cast sorcerers after all of your additional upkeep steps after this phase. I really like that. Number 36 is a card that I was actually thinking about building. It's Riku of Many Paths, red, blue, green for a 3-3. Three, three. Whenever you cast a modal spell, choose up to X, where X is the number of times you chose a mode for that spell. Exile the top card of your library. Until the end of your next turn, you may play it. You can put a 1-1 one, one counter on him, and it gains trample until end of turn, or you can create a 1-1 one, one blue bird creature token with flying. I like this because it allows you to play like the Mystic Confluences, the Cryptic Commands, you know, the Charms. I think that's really fun and you get a little bit of extra value about it and it comes down really early. I, I think that this is a pretty interesting way to make like a Teamer Commander because I feel like Teamer gets a little bit stagnant sometimes. Teamer can and this is a sweet one. Why don't you walk me through an example of like, you know, let's say I cast a Teamer Charm and I choose one of the modes. I can now then choose either to Impulse Draw, put a counter, or get a 1-1 one, one bird, because I only chose one mode. But if I cast Mystic Confluence and chose Counter a Spell, unless they pay three, Counter a Spell, unless they pay three, bounce a creature to their owner's hands, I've now chosen two modes, and I can then put a counter on something or make a, and make a bird. You can only put counters on Riku himself. On his Riku and make a bird. That's, that's yes. what I said. You are correct. You can choose two modes in that instance, and then you can choose two modes on Riku. But I do like the fact that with the Exile, it's until the end of your next turn. It gives you a little bit more of a window than some other cards do. Yeah, start counting the number of Outlaws of Thunder Junction that say Exile, Top Card Library, you can play it. Uh, there, there, There's many of them, and they don't exile it in the same amount of time. Some of them are this turn, and some of them are until the end of your next turn. We're going to jump into a very simple commander at number 35. Malcolm the Eyes, blue-red for a 2-2 flying haste. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, investigate. There's This is really simple. I'm Getting extra permanents for casting double spells is nice. It is card draw. Eventually, when you cash it in for the mana, it's cheap, so it comes down. It dies a couple times. It still keeps on chugging. Malcolm, once he comes down, I think you want to then follow it up with a second spell so you're not just passing. You're always going to play Malcolm and then get a clue, which is just nice. You build up artifacts, you build up permanents, and you spin your wheels. He's fine. He's not bad. He definitely just only has a couple lines of text, and I feel like while the effect is very good, unless you have a ton of payoffs, it's kind of forgettable. I appreciate a simple commander design because it makes videos like this easier, and not every commander needs 87 lines of text. Like the next one, number 34, Magda the Horde Master. One red for a 2-2. Whenever you commit a crime, you create a tap treasure token only once each turn, though. If you sack three treasure tokens, you create a 4-4 red scorpion dragon creature token with flying and haste, but only at sorcery speed. So you can't get a little bit weird with it and get it on opponent's turns. Yes, and you can sacrifice tapped treasures. You just can't use them for mana the same turn. Red can probably commit crimes pretty easily. I think it's feasible to say that you commit four crimes in a turn cycle once you're, you know, past like turn five in the past the developing stages. But the payoff is like a 4-4 every once in a while. I'm not thrilled. 
And if I want to have three treasures on the board, it's like, do I want to be using three treasures for a 4-4 four, four, or literally anything else? Sometimes you just want three mana. Yeah, sometimes you want three mana. You could pour it into, like, Crackle with Power or something better, you I know? Mean, you get that option. You can obviously do either one with Magda. She does say Naked Dragon or... Use it for mana? Use it for Crackle with Power. <laughs> There's only two red spells in Commander, but... Uh... <laughs> every, every red spell is either 4-4 four, four Dragon or Crackle with Power. Change my mind. <laughs> so obviously Command Crimes is going to be very powerful in this deck, but I think, again, the tap treasures and once per turn really limit this card. Yeah, get your Goblin Bombardments. That's a good way to commit crimes repeatedly. Uh, number 33, Kemball, Profiteering Mayor. One black, white for a 2-4. Whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your opponent's control, for each of them, you get a tapped token that's a copy of it only once each turn <laughs> that's the outlaws slogan and whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your control each opponent loses one and you gain one this is a weird card if your opponent if your opponent's worm coil engine dies they will get two worm tokens and you will get two tapped worm tokens because it says whenever one or more enter you get a token of each of them however if somebody just makes a treasure you now get a treasure for that turn and then nothing going for going forward this is not bad i'd say but I think you need to be playing the things that give your opponent stuff. And then if Campbell's not out, then they just have extra stuff. If you're playing the Forbidden Orchards, not bad. I mean, you get a 1-1 Spirit, and then each opponent loses one, and you gain one. But have one offering. Now they're losing three. That is pretty good. But in the end, it's like if Campbell's not here, it's like, okay, well, I guess you have extra stuff now. That's really cool. I think you can play this so that you're not really giving out stuff every five seconds. I think you play some of the cards we talked about that are good on the, by themselves that happen to give away tokens. And as your opponent just start making tokens this will just slowly drain them and as you make tokens you can just skip the first line if you don't care about it take the you know one percent value of them just playing stuff and then you just flood the board with your own tokens your own treasures your own clues and drain them out that way i think campbell much like his previous incarnation is going to stick on the board a little bit too long and not always justify removal so he'll just be annoying this is value and he comes down very cheap so if you do need to replay him later he is pretty easily replayable yeah next is one of the most confusing cards in the set i think for me at least number 32 satoru the infiltrator why don't you why don't you enlighten us about that one blue black for a two three with Minache. whenever it and slash are one or more non-token creatures etv under your control if none of them were cast or no mana was spent to cast them draw a card get your ninjutsu and ornithopters ready yes it is caring about plot ninjutsu in a with no ninjutsu just in general this is a commander plant um there's a loose yeah like i said there's a loose plot synergy but it's just a ninjas card but it's not the best ninjas card it's kind of just there and i think it probably goes into the ninjas decks but this is not a ninjas commander that i'm like oh yeah this satoru is the ninja guy if i want ninja commander i don't want commander tax because i already got the one that doesn't have commander tax so, so why spoiled. would i be playing this one we're so spoiled number 31 fiddlethip lost on the range one blue blue for one one with ward two like every other commander <laughs> hey you know this is the first instance of ward you may look at the top card of your library anytime the top card of your library has plot and you can plot non-land cards from the top of your library so it's future sight but they're free next turn, and you don't get to cast them this turn. This is weird, and you cannot plot lands. It's worth noting that lands are dead to you. You can't keep the value train rolling. I'm trying to think of cards that cost a lot to, that would cost not a lot of mana to plot, but that have very good effects, and I think it's the opposite. You know, there's cards like Dig Through Time that have a high mana cost that you can actually cast in practice for very cheap. But I don't know of a card that's like one mana and has some crazy effects. At that point, I would rather just play Suspend or something, you know? Maybe that is the way to go. Some of the Suspend cards, like you could plot the one card for zero, uh, Ancestral Vision, and then next turn just draw three. Okay, yeah, maybe, but also, I don't know. When I think of like Suspend, I think of like Soul Talisman. Inevitable Betrayal, and then Ancestral Vision, and then- That's it. That's it. That's, it. That's your it. entire deck. And... Uh, hope to draw those. <laughs> Let me know of any other cool cards that go in this Fibbletip deck, because I love Fibbletip, but I'm just not seeing it that much with this one. I'm sick of seeing Fibbletip. Number 30 is the cutest cactus in OTJ. It's Kiri, Talented Sprout. One green, red, white for a 0-3. Other plants and tree folks you control get plus 2, plus 0. At the beginning of your post-combat main phase, return target plant, tree folk, or land card from your graveyard to your hand. I guess you could be playing plants and tree folk, but mostly we're caring about that land part. That's the, uh, the floor for me, is you just kind of return a fetch land every turn. I don't think that's that bad. This is totally one of those middle-of-the-road commanders. It's number 30 out of 52... So it's slightly below the middle. There's nothing 
other than the fact that it's Naya, which is an interesting color combination, there's nothing really about this that screams, you know, powerhouse to me. Tree Folk, uh, you lose all the black ones, and I don't know what plants or Tree Folk are in red, so I don't know what the point of having red is. Maybe you just make a Naya lands deck and you forget the rest of it. However, if that's the case, have I got a commander for you like 20 spots from now? I really am interested in the fact that they keep bringing Naya and like returning stuff from graveyards into the same like equation. I think that's a pretty cool thing that Wizards is doing. But I do admit that a lot of slots up that we are going to have a better Lands Matters commander deck. Yep, two cactus folk in a row, though. We got number 29 is Bristly Bill, Spine Sower. That's a good name. We needed more names like this in the set. One in a green for a 2 2 landfall. Put a plus one plus one counter on target creature and pay five and double the number of plus one plus one counters on each creature you control. That can get a little nasty. I don't know if green has too many ways to reduce the abilities, mana value, like the value of the ability. Heartstone maybe is one, but if you can spam doubling the counters on your whole team and it starts to get like obnoxious. Bristly Bill can be your enabler and your win con. Five mana is a lot for that payoff, but it can get really big real fast. I mean, big green stompy, right? It's it's a name and an archetype for a reason. Yeah, I think thinking of mono green landfall decks, I kind of get bored a little bit, but this one feels kind of interesting and it's more punchy than like combo-y. It's not just value. It's like, okay, I would like to attack because the counters matter. I'd rather play against this than Tatiova all day. Number 28 is the cutest thing with dead eyes in OTJ. It's loot, the key to everything. Green, blue, and a red for a 1-2. Ward 1. There's that ward. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top X cards of your library, where X is the number of card types among other non-land permanents you control. You may play those cards this turn. Get out your solemn simulacrums. Sometimes it feels like the legends in this set are just trading words back and forth because we're impulse drawing again. We've got ward again. But this time, you can't play the cards until the end of your next turn. You can only play the cards this turn. I don't think loot really asks you to do anything other than just play a bunch of permanent types that you're probably playing anyway. Throw some battles in there, throw some walkers in there, and it's just a generic card uh, card draw engine. That seems good. Like, this just seems like a good card. I have no complaints. I'm just not, whoa, I'm not dying to build loot. I'm just, I, this is a good card. I mean, this is just way less powerful attracts of the Grand Unifier, Thank right? Thank God. <laughs> I mean, good, but also, like, eh, it's like... I don't know. I think, again, it's very forgettable because it seems like everything's trading keywords. What is this, Doctor Who? Yeah, it is Doctor Who. Doctor Who was the set where everything said, whenever you cast a historic, historic spell, spell, create a clue, token, and a food token. And when you, when you cast clue, your second, you second top of the library graveyard mana. historic spell. That's, course, that was every Doctor Who card. Read ahead. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully we don't get too many more of those, but there's a little bit in this set. Number 27, Bruce Tarl, Roving Rancher. 4 mana, 4, 3, Oxen you control have Double Strike, which is only relevant because when he enters the battlefield or attacks, Impulse Draw, and if it's a land, you get an Oxen that's a 2-2. Two, two. Otherwise, you can cast it until the end of your next turn. Not this turn, until the end of your next turn. So if you have a land and you're just like kind of getting landscape, you're like, oh, well, I didn't really want this Ox. I would have really preferred the land. Oh, but. I was thinking in a more positive light of when you don't need lands and they're dead draws, you get two two double strikes instead. Yeah. So I'm more of a glass half full guy. I guess. When it comes to Bruce Tarl. I'm just happy that it does say until the end of your next turn, you know, yet again, they are flip-flopping words around. Yeah, can you keep it straight? I don't know, but we can because we got the text right in front of us. I think Bruce Tarl, there's not much here. It's kind of, if you just replace this with four mana, four, three attacks or enters draw card, that's just a solid Boros card, but you can't really build around it other than to throw a bunch of changelings in your deck, you know, mirror entity and give your whole team double strike. That's a nice little wrinkle. I think it gives you just a little bit of extra brewing inspiration to get to 100 cards and then feel satisfied. Torrid Mauler, here we go. <laughs> here we go. We are so bad. <laughs> Number 26, Crom, Violet Cacophony. Two blue red for a 2-3 with flying. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on him and draw a card. This is another simple one. You get a little bit of value every time only you cast your second spell each turn. But if you have a lot of cheap spells, it could really matter because you could you're it's just an engine of keeping drawn cards and you make them bigger. There's a lot of blue red legends in this set and the commander sets for some reason, but Krom is just like Malcolm in that you're gonna play him and then follow him up immediately with something. Get bake him into a three four, draw your card right away, and then you feel pretty good about it. Even if he dies once or twice, he's gonna get you your value like instantaneously. So I'm not too worried about it. But I, I don't know what a Krom deck has anything going for it. I don't know what a Crown Deck has going for it other than just like generic value. I don't know what to build around here. It's just kind of good. I do like the fact that he makes himself bigger so he does have just a little bit of like commander damage. Maybe you can get that because I feel like people wouldn't really be using 
removal on him targeted at least until they were almost close to dying but i still don't think that he's that great yeah maybe you can do some kind of ultron thing he's the perfect middle of this list right here he was 26 dead center crom number 25 doc orlock grizzled genius blue green for two three spells you cast from your graveyard or from exile cost two less and plotting cards cost two less so not only can you do this cool plotting uh thing for cheaper but you can flashback spells and stuff like that for way cheaper so there's like a decent amount of stuff going. I think you can get, um, there's a couple spells in blue green that let you cast cards from your graveyard repeatedly. And that is like, it's going to go off because this is not restricted to once per turn. I think the flashback is super cool. I think this is a better way to plot than like Fibble Thip, for instance. I, I don't know. Like I wasn't really feeling Fibble Thip, but I can see this because you can play into those graveyard synergies. Actually it does not work with Fibble Thip. I know you didn't say it did, but just in case somebody thought it might, they actually, now I'm just thinking about it. They don't work together. So Nambo, don't play Doc with, with Fibble Thib. Just play Doc instead of Fibble Thib. Number 24, Laughing Jasper Flint. One black red for a 4-3. Creatures you control but don't own are mercenaries in addition to their other types, which makes them outlaws, by the way. That's just like the big overarching thing. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top X cards of target opponent's library where X is the number of outlaws you control. Till end of turn, you can cast spells from among those cards and mana of any type can be spent to cast those spells. So you are just going to be building a bunch of outlaws, maybe like the things that come in and say, you know, it also creates a 1-1 mercenary or whatever. You pick an opponent, you're going to get some value off their library and then you're going to steal their stuff and make some more some careful you only get those spells until the end of the turn this isn't one of those instances where you wait till the end of your next turn i mean it's certainly not confusing this one is only until the end of the turn it's kind of like you're drawing a couple cards you know once you get past like four five six mercenaries uh outlaws you're only getting access to more cards it's not like you're going to actually cast all six of them but it is nice to have more access how do you think laughing jasper actually laughs how do you think he does it? I think he's like, ah, ah, ah. He holds his stomach. I I think he's hollowish. I mean, like the equivalent of like, you know, the bone xylophone that sometimes people play. And That's like, how tiny, tiny bones would sound, right? Like the... What was that? Can you do that in the mic? <laughs> I think Jasper Flint kind of sounds hollow because for some reason I'm picturing him without internal organs. You think he he's just a lizard dude? <laughs> he's a lizard guy. I thought he was a ghoul. No, he's just a guy. He's hollow. That's Jasper's thing. He's hollow. Uh, number 23 is Annie Flash, the veteran. Three white, red, green for a 4-5 with Flash. Classic Annie Flash. When she enters the battlefield, if you cast it, return target permanent card with mana value 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Tapped. So a little bit of a sun titan impression. And when she becomes tapped, exile the top two cards of your library. You can play those cards this turn. Only this turn. Not until the end of your next turn, like you may think with other cards in the set. I think this is incredibly limited by the fact that it's not ETB and just it is just ETB if you cast it. That's just like not as much value as I want for a six mana commander. I think it refunds itself a little bit by giving you a three mana thing right away. I, I don't know. I just see this as once that thing is a one-time deal, you can't flicker it, but then it's a value engine after that because it's just going to draw you two cards every turn. I do like the fact, as I mentioned earlier, that Naya is bringing back some like weird graveyard stuff. I do like that, but I, I guess the exile thing is fine. I, I, I think it's cool, but... I don't know. I, I, I really think it's kind of whatever, too. I think this card can actually take over the game, honestly. I might disagree with you a little bit because I think end step, you flash this in, get your best thing back. Maybe you even just can get a land back and ramp the next turn. Untap with it. Then you crew a vehicle or attack or something. Draw two cards, and now you kind of rinse and repeat. You might want some ways to protect her because she's six mana, but the flash is nice. Just seems a little bit expensive for my tastes. Number 22, Giralf the Flesh Right. Two and a blue for a 2-3. Whenever you cast a spell during your turn other than your first spell that turn, you create a 2-2 blue and black zombie rogue creature token. Whenever a zombie ETBs under your control, you put a 1-1 counter on it for each other zombie that ETBed under your control this turn. This card's confusing, but it's decent. So if I cast, let's say Giralf's my first spell. I cast Giralf, then I play Ornithopter. Well, that's my second spell, so I get one zombie. Now if I cast a Memnite, I'm just kind of listing spells, I will now get a 2-2, two, two, but it'll enter the battlefield with one plus one plus one counter because I had one other zombie enter the battlefield under my control this turn. It's a lot of accounting for a decent amount of power toughness. I don't think it is worth it for your mental, you know, having to calculate this every single time you do anything, but I do think if you could just play this as it's supposed to go, like on Arena, this card's pretty sick. It's one of those, like, write that down, write that down. Yeah, write that down. <laughs> Wait, I have four zombies enter, and then I cast three spells. Okay, hold on, guys. I do think that the power buff is really nice. It comes down for three mana, which is super cool. 
but I do think that the when you cast you know a spell other than your first this turn, so second and above, it's kind of played out too. Yeah, but it doesn't work on anyone else's turn. So you kind of have to like go off at sorcery speed and lay your cards on the table. So there's a little bit of a weakness there. I think if it was just applied anywhere, you know, he'd be you higher hold on the pass, list. You know, yeah. you can actually just hold up a little bit of interaction and maybe get some value out of it. Time for number 21, Breaches the Blast Maker. One blue red for a 3 3 menace. This has one of the weirdest faces I've ever seen on a card. It makes me uncomfortable. Zoom in on it. <laughs> Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, you can sacrifice an artifact and flip a coin. When you win the flip, copy the spell. If you lose the flip, deal damage equal to its mana value to any target. So you want artifacts and you want a lot of instant sorceries. And past that, you don't really care what happens because you either get extra value and copy the spell or you just shoot something down and make sure, you know, if I'm casting a two mana value target, I'll know that in the event of a fail and a loss, I have a thing in play with two toughness or the two damage matters. I feel like everything, as I mentioned earlier, maybe in a different video, everything makes like artifact tokens nowadays. I feel like it's pretty easy to get those artifacts even if you are in a spell slinger deck or you're just getting treasures from something that you have. In general, it's pretty easy to accrue those. And if you don't want to copy that spell, you don't have to sack the artifact either. Yeah, this is a nice one. You're kind of right. You could maybe just play all of the cards, all the spells that make treasure like Prismari Command is in these colors. Strike it rich, even. You just make the treasure really quick. Then you do something to pay it off. What's There's... Yeah, what's the name of the one that just came out that was, like, for each opponent, investigate... Yeah, uh, I mean, there's... We just talked about, like, most worth buying. Oh, Ethereal Investigator? That, that's an old one, but that does count. Yeah, or just... Uh, I feel like there's another one that just came out, too, that, like, has a similar text line, but you can get a lot of value just by playing these, like, kind of three-for-one, like, permanent-type deals, and then you just can sacrifice them and copy the spells that you cast. Breaches is weird and good. So how about number 20? Number 20 is the Pan Harm Onicon. Felix Five Boots, two black, green, blue... For a 5-4 with Menace in Word 2 because this was made in 2024. If a creature you control deal in combat damage to a player causes a triggered ability of a permit you control to trigger, it triggers an additional time. So it's just Yarok but for combat damage instead of ETBs. A saboteur. Get all of your deals, combat damage, triggers. Get your swords of X and Y. This is sick. I think the Word 2 really helps on cards like this as much as we joke about it. It helps this thing not just die immediately and then your whole game plan falls apart. Because this is, I think this is a pretty tame text box. But I think when you build around it, it can ramp up like pretty significantly. I think Felix is adorable too. He's got five boots. He's got five boots. I love him. She doesn't think Fibblethip's cute, but she thinks Felix five boots is cute. <laughs> yes, he's got five boots. Let's keep moving. Number 19, Olivia, Opulent Outlaw. One red, black, white for a 3-3 three, three flying lifelink. Whenever more, one or more outlaws you control deal combat damage to a player, you get a treasure. And three, sacrifice two treasures. Put two plus one plus one counters on each creature you control. Activate only as a sorcery. We did, uh, we did dock this uh, precon a little bit for just like the weird quality of it. But separate that from this because I think Olivia is a really cool commander and she doesn't ask a lot of you, which is why we were so baffled why the precon had a seven sub-themes in it. She says... Deal combat damage to stuff, and then... Play outlaws? Make some... No, yeah, yeah. Deal combat damage with outlaws, make some treasures, put counters on your whole team. You don't have to have them all be outlaws. You just need a couple outlaws doing the dirty work. I think it's pretty good. There are so many good outlaw synergies because it's like the rogues and the pirates and whatever. And then there are also so many good treasure sub-themes in Mardu. And then dealing combat damage, that's just kind of what Mardu loves to do. So... This is a very cool commander. I'm not even looking too much at the second ability because I probably wouldn't be using it that much, but this would just be more value than anything else. Mia doesn't want to win with attacks. She just wants to win with Mirkwood Bats in every deck. Oh, absolutely. Mirkwood Bats is sweet. I got you figured out. <laughs> Number 18, another commander from the pre-cons. It's Gonti, Canny Acquisitor. Two green, blue, black for a 5-5. Five, five. Spells you cast but don't own cost one less to cast. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, look at the top card of their library, then exile it face down. You can play that card for as long as it remains exiled, and mana of any type can be spent to cast that spell. I love the fact that it's not tied to Gonti. Yes, it, just like the other Gonti, it is not tied to him in any way, but you do want to keep him around because you get the, re the reduction on the cost. And it kind of balances the fact that drawing cards from your library is worse than drawing cards from my library. However, if your cards are cheaper than my cards, I kind of want to draw cards from your deck. And now you just play all the stupid little evasive one ones that can't be blocked or have flying or whatever, shadow, and then you get a bunch of triggers and you stack them up. And now all these cards are in your hand, but you know, they're not uh, subject to discard. They're just there forever. And that could be enough, even if Gonti dies once or twice, to 
bury your opponents in card advantage that they can't come back from. I mean, when I think of Sultai, sometimes I think of like the stealing other people's stuff too, like Villainous Wealth, one of the main Sultai cards that I think people think Classic. of. Classic. So I think Gonti is a super cool commander to bring to that archetype. Yeah, when you're, you're going to play Gonti and already have the pieces in play to trigger him three times in the first go, get a bunch of cards, and then you go, oh no, Gonti died, whatever, I'll just cast all these spells. I have just a bunch waiting here ready for it. Number 17, Karavek, the Punisher. Nobody thought Karavek would be in this set. One black black for a 3-3. Whenever you commit a crime, exile up to one target black card from your graveyard and copy it. You may cast the copy. If you do, you lose two life. This is not once per turn, but they gave you like a lose two life to tell you that, hey, you can't just do this forever, but you kind of can because you have 40 life in Commander. And so if I target like Hero's Downfall in my graveyard, I can cast it, which is now committing a crime, which just chains with all the other uh, instant and sorcery removal spells in my graveyard. That's kind of nice. It's just like, it costs mana. You have to cast the spell, so you can't chain forever. And they do exile, so it's like, you get two uses out of your murders, basically. Make sure your graveyard is stacked, and make sure you have the mana to do it. And But overall, I think you can get a lot of value of it, because two life is not a lot of life to lose. It's basically just a, a, a warning. Tickle. A verbal warning. Hey, watch it. <laughs> Bro. Number 16 is a card that I'm surprised BZ didn't have us put higher. It's Honest Rusty, one black green for a 3-2. When it ETBs, you return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. So it's a good, like, overall just reduction on your creatures and then a little bit of graveyard recursion, and it does not matter whether you've cast it because you can flicker it back and forth and just get value to your hand. Yeah, I don't know if... I think maybe flickering more of the sacrificing and replaying with uh, green-black... But um, I, I love this card. This is like everything I want to do. It's I love reduction text, and I also love regrowth effects. And so when I looked at this, I was like, am I going to build another green-black deck? Do I want to play Please Honest no. Rutstein with Umori Companion? That would be so cool, because then you can use Rutstein to get back something. Then you play Umori for reduced cost. Now it reduces your creatures by two. And if Umori dies, you can use Honest Rutstein to get it back. See, this is why I was like, I'm surprised BZ was like, yeah, you know, number one's really cool, but what if we put Honors Rusty in a bubble? What if we put this uncommon <laughs> in the top five? <laughs> He's so cool. Number 15 here is an actual uh, non-uncommon. It's Vihan Gold Waker, red, black, white for a 3-3. Other outlaws you control have Vigilance and Haste. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you can have treasures you control turn into 3-3 outlaws uh, in addition to their other types, which obviously means they're going to have Vigilance and Haste. So this is Cyber Drive Awakener, overrun whatever you want to call it for treasures this is basically the quintessential treasure commander now right i think this is super cool the fact that you can be attacking with the treasures you just make you can sacrifice them afterwards after you get that damage in and then use the mana for something else and if you have things like pitiless plunderer it's basically free or mahati or something like that mirkwood bats as vc mentioned earlier yeah i'm gonna have to deal with this deck because she's gonna you're probably gonna oh build it's this. so cool i do love the fact i that we have cyber drive awaker in non-blue now yeah because those cards you mentioned are all sick. Like, Pitiless Plunder, all your treasures are creatures, so when they die, you just get the same number of treasures, so you get all that mana for free. And then Mahati's the same thing. You stack all those cre creature treasures, get all the mana because it sees creatures died, and the treasure is back for next turn. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And if Mirkwood Bats is involved, you're dead. And then also, like, Blood Artist triggers because they will be creatures when you sack them. And I think that this is a little bit too close to my Mahati deck, but I think this is super cool, and I would definitely be playing this if you wanted a treasure-based commander. Yeah, uh, number 14, we got Gisa the Hellraiser. Three black black for a 4-4 four, four, ward, two, and two life. Skeletons and zombies you control get plus one, plus one, and have menace. And whenever you commit a crime, you get two tapped, two, two blue and black zombie rogues that only triggers once a turn because this is a very strong crime ability. You get six power in zombies, and you can keep doing this on, um, you know, like various turns. It's not just during your turn. So I can get up to eight zombies in the course of a go around you are going to need some very cheap crimes to commit but i do think this is a very powerful ability especially the fact that they get menace out of it too yeah the menace if gisa sticks around you're just in a huge attack all by herself i feel like there could be a gisa deck that's just protect gisa play your malika rebirth effect so she can't really die the war 2 is already kind of annoying so they're going to be taxed and two life yeah they just commit infinite crimes not infinite but just commit a million crimes and just have a thousand zombies in play and that's all you need to do to win i think that this is really powerful and you can just create an army in a snap oh you know what did i mention also you could just play this in a zombies deck commit crimes as a bonus and then play gisa 
when you already have zombies and attack with those right away with menace. Like zombies needed another payoff. Okay, how about skeletons then? <laughs> Play a skeleton deck. Good, because we got some in LCI. Number 13, Marchesa, Dealer of Death. Let me just say, Marchesa's a queen. I don't know why she's an outlaw, too. It's either you're either the government or you're not the government. And so pick one, Marchesa. Who would give up being a queen? <laughs> I wouldn't. Red, blue, black for a 3-4. Whenever you commit a crime, you can pay one. If you do, look at the top two cards of your library, put one to your hand, and then the other in your graveyard. That is very cheap to be getting that much advantage. Very simple design. And I like this one, and I'm glad it made it this high. I want, I want more simple designs because this reads well, and it... It's only confusing in the sense that most crime committing has restrictions, but this one doesn't because it, the restriction is you have to pay mana. Um, they can't just let you commit infinite crimes. There's no card that lets you just do that. So this is like, treat it like you play Lethal Scheme or something, right? You convoke it out for free, kill something. Now, in addition to that, you can just pay one and draw a card. It's even better than that because you get selection and you get to send something into the graveyard. So I'm thinking you play all the kill spells that have flashback, all the free ones like Deadly Rollick, and you just go to Value Town. I think this is what we were joking about with Gisa. This is the actual deck. This is so much value. In Grixis, you're going to be able to find a ton of things to target in those colors. I mean, Gisa goes in this deck for sure because this is just Crime City. <laughs> this is Crime City. That's that's the plane Thunder that she... Junction. No, that's what Marchesa rules over, right? Crime City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's queen of Crime City, which is why she's also the dealer of death and an outlaw. Yeah. If you were excited 30 minutes ago when I was reading Kiri and you were like, wow, a Naya card that gets lands back from the graveyard... Let me introduce you to Yuma, Proud Protector of Kiri. Five red, green, white for a 6-6. Six, six. This spell costs one less to cast for each land in your graveyard. And whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, you can sack a land to draw a card. And whenever a desert is put into your graveyard from anywhere, you get a 4-2 green plant warrior creature token with reach. This card is another one that suffered a lot at the helm of the precon. But when you unshackle it from that and you just go, what's the best Yuma deck? Oh my god. Yuma is only ever going to cost three mana. You can't keep this thing off the field. They're just going to keep getting sack land, draw card value from it. The land's probably a desert. They're going to be pooping out four twos. Even self-milling, if I play Seder Wayfinder and I mill two deserts with it, that's two four twos in the same effect. BZ knows how powerful this is because this is just Naya Land, Commander of Carador. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But it, I think that's great. The, I love cost reduction stuff. I play Oscar as well. Another commander who only ever costs two mana is such a headache. They only need to have a minor ability to be a headache because it's never going away. Just like every one of BZ's decks, you can shut it down with one well-timed Bajuka Bog. Yes, that's why Mia plays Bajuka Bog, even in like your five color decks. <laughs> I think a little bit of graveyard hate never hurt, especially with commanders like Yuma. This is so much value. Yuma is going to be sick. I think Yuma's going to give you some trouble, especially since it kind of creates its own armies. The 4-2 is like pretty chunky and to be making a couple of them. Uh, I think Yuma's great. And I think, I don't know. I don't know if I want to build it. It's looking a little tempting. I can see you definitely building it. You do need an eye deck. Just don't bog me. Uh, and we'll go to number 11. <laughs> Bonnie Paul, clear cutter. This is the most boring commander in the set. Three green, blue, blue for a 6-5 reach. ETB, you create a legendary blue ox that's equal to your uh, power toughness, equal to the number of lands you control. And whenever you attack, you grow spiral. Uh, this is very good. You play it. You get a 6-6 six, six or something. Then you attack with something else. Get a growth spiral right away. Kind of go, cool, I'm ramping into my next Bonnie. If you want to kill it, that's fine. I have a big creature that's still left over. Uh, just boring, cynic value. It, other than the reference, it adds nothing to my life. It is just Simic Value Town. I do like that, but just remember you can only have one Bew at a time because he is legendary. Yes, you can only have one Bow, I think. Bew? Bow? Sure. I don't think it's Bew. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Look, Bonnie Paul and Bew. Get him, Bew. <laughs> pew, pew. <laughs> But you can only have one ox at a time because... But he's going to get really, really big when you are ramping this fast. Yeah, it's like, oh, darn, I can only have 180 at a time, and I'll just keep growth spiraling. Thanks, Bonnie. Number 10, Kellen the Kid, white, green, and a blue for 3-3 three, three with flying and lifelink. Whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand, you can cast a permanent spell with equal or lesser mana value from your hand without paying its mana cost. If you don't, you put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. So this requires a little bit of build around because you're going to need like some exile effects or you're going to need some graveyard effects or whatever with flashback. But that is such a powerful ability stapled onto him, and for three mana coming down, that is so cheap. Yeah, I'm thinking of uh, the thing that Kellen makes me think of that I'm surprised he doesn't have is adventure, because every other Kellen has had adventure, so I thought he was going to go on some kind of color pie journey. Nope, he's just bant now, I guess. I guess he's already done with the journey. But you can, so casting an adventure spell from exile gives you like a Kodama effect, and then if I, you know, cascade into a four drop, I can cast a four drop permanent from my hand. And I think the... It's underrated being able to do that land thing. Just kind of put it out. They come in untapped. So if you want, if you've got a lot of spells to chain, he sort of gives you a reduction. 
by putting lands out over and over. I think this is the first Kellen card that is actually memorable to me, so I am happy to see it. Could you name any of the other Kellens? Kellen on a Boros Adventure. That's one. That is one. And Kellen on the Simic Adventure. That's two. There's one more. There's more? There's one more Kellen. Okay, just for reference, guys, BZ made a thumbnail with Kellen in it. I thought it was Annie Flash. So Kellen's really not that memorable to me. The but other, then. You got the other one? Sorry. Kellen. No. It's Celestia. The Kellen was Celestia. We're okay. going to move on as we get through our top 10. Good job, Kellen. Uh, number nine, Eris, Roar of the Storm, eight blue red for a 4-4. Four, four. This spell costs two less to cast for each different mana value among instant and sorceries in your graveyard. Flying Prowess. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, you get a 4-4 four, four red dragon elemental creature token with flying and prowess. Can you see what we were saying about just mixing the words around all these kinds? This I think that's what happens when you make so many legends. Oh, God, this feels like every other legend we've already read, and then there's still eight more after this to read. They just but keep getting better, though. This one is only ever blue-red for a 4-4. Four, four. It's pretty easy to get five mana values. Like, you're not going to be able to cast this for two mana on turn three, but on turn five, six plus, when you're thought scouring and mental noting in the early game, this is very, very castable. It also demands graveyard hate, or it's going to continuously poop out four fours, and you can just start slinging spells on other people's turns to poop out additional four fours and just win with those. I do kind of love the fact that it eats its commander tax for breakfast, you know? I think it'll be very easy to be casting it for two on turn, like, what, four or five, maybe? Yeah, unlike Yuma and Carador, you can't really go into turn 50 having this cost two mana. Once it dies like three times, there's only so many numbers of mana values you can have in your graveyard, but I don't think that's going to be an issue. Eris is a lot of power for cheap, and if I didn't have a blue-red deck already, I'd be looking at this one. <laughs> Plus it has prowess, and all of the creature tokens have prowess too, so if you're casting a bunch of, bunch of spells, these things are going to get huge. Yeah, they're basically like six six flyers, because I want to cast two spells on my turn, so that's just that's a lot of power to make very quickly. Moving on to a card that does not look like a magic card. It's number eight, Roxanne, Starfall Savant. Three green red for a 4-3. ETB or attacks, you get a tapped meteorite. That deals two to something when it hits, and it taps for mana of any color. And whenever you tap an artifact token for mana, you get an extra mana of any type that artifact token produced. This is kind of sick. I like the fact that it's really telling you to make treasures, or you can try to flicker her and get not only mana rocks, but also like a little bit of interaction. You can pick off utility creatures with this. I like that it fuels itself, so it makes itself easier to cast just by nature of being cast and attacking. It works really well with getting haste. I think Roxanne's sweet. If you can create multiple copies of that meteorite, maybe you could be dealing damage a lot, but because those copies wouldn't come in tapped, they only come in tapped if it's her bringing them in. Yeah, if you make copies for some other reason, but I was just also thinking, throw an Amulet of Vigor down, and now Roxanne basically costs three and just rebates you every time she does anything, and it's kind of gets silly at that point. That could be really cool. Number seven is Silvala, Eager Trailblazer. I'm surprised to see Silvala in this set. But she here she is, two green white for a four five with vigilance. Whenever you cast a creature spell, you create one one red mercenary with a bunch of other text. And if you tap her and choose a color, add one mana of that color for each different power among creatures you control. This can get nutty. They kind of keep making Silvala potentially really nutty, uh, and I like that that she's she's sort of like oh first it's parlay, but she's got really weird rules text with like maybe you try to cast a spell and then you can't pay for it because the parlay doesn't give you a set amount of mana. That card's really weird. The mono green one, absolute combo machine. The card's bonkers. And then this one, we kind of get like a mix between the two where it's really strong and it can combo with things because she taps for a bunch of mana. But I like the, the ceiling of just like, oh, I got six different powers. Yeah, cool. I'll just make six mana. What did Savala even do to gain these powers? You know, is she one like special in the story or does she just keep getting like banger cards? I think she just goes on hikes. Cool. Cool. Okay, number six, Vraska the Silencer. One green black for a 3-3 death touch. Whenever a non-token creature an opponent controls dies, you can pay one and return it as a treasure that's tapped uh, to your battlefield. That's pretty sick. So now we're throwing kill spells left and right at our opponent's things. Maybe we fire off a big board, but we turn them into treasures. So if the creature is not very useful, we can sack it for mana on the later turn. But if it's got an ETB static ability, some kind of dies trigger, we can get that all for just one mana with the initial Raska effect. Plus, jamming our deck full of kill spells is already a pretty decent strategy. I really do like this. I think it's a lot of fun. The fact that you have to pay, like, limits it to where it's not absolutely broken, but you can just have, like, the Butcher of Malakir effects and stuff and just have him sacrifice everything, and then you have your pick of what creatures you want from their fields. Oh, yeah. If you get, like, a Grave Pact going and now you can just play, like, very small creatures 
and then hold up all your mana to just steal or all their stuff. Or the altar or something. Yeah, couldn't you get that like, going. Couldn't that just like combo? I don't think there's too much comboing to go with Vraska. Maybe you get like four or five card combos, but yeah. she's just really good. She's so good. So much value. All right, our next card is also a simplish design. It's a cool, the unrepentant, black, black, red, red, five, five, flampler. Sacrifice three other creatures. You can put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield only at sorcery speed and only once each turn. Play dummy, dummy, dummy on the first three turns of the game. Then play a cool, sacrifice your dummies, get dice triggers because that's probably what they have, and then put out an Eldrazi, Arkin of Cruelty, Razaketh, Villas, and now I don't know what your opponents are supposed to do because... You're way ahead. I don't care that it's like only once each turn at sorcery speed. I'm going to be cheating so much mana turn four. That's all it takes. And it's going to be like, oh, would you like to trade three one one goblins for like a twelve mana thing? Of course I would. Yeah, that's the other thing about a cool is there's I would say there's basically no way to stop the first trigger of this. They're gonna play stupid little you know, disposable things in the beginning of the game, you're not going to go out of your way to kill them because it's not worth your time. Then as soon as they play a cull, they have priority. They're just going to snap it off, activate the ability, and then put something huge down. And now you have to decide, do I want to kill a cull so they don't can't do that again? Or do I want to kill the giant Aldrazi that has Annihilator or something? And this is like, it's going to put so much pressure on you as soon as the game starts. If you don't have a counter spell immediately, you're going to have a rough time. Number four, I think this card has so much value. The Gitrog, Ravenous Ride, three green black for a 6-5 with Trample and Haste. When it deals combat damage to a player, you can sack a creature that saddled it this turn. If you do, you draw X and put X land cards from your hand onto the battlefield tab where X is the sacrifice creature's power. And you can saddle it with basically any creature because it only has saddle one. This is, there's so much going on. And every time I read this card, it kind of just bumped up in my rankings. I was like, wait. It's got trample and haste. It doesn't care about how much damage gets through. You can crew it. You can saddle it with anything. There's a ton of cheap creatures that we talked about in our uh, top ten of like there's like rumbleweed and primeval protector and hierophant bio titan whatever that thing's called. There's a bunch of stuff like that that's pretty cheap. Even like grothama five mana ten power. They can saddle get wrong right away. It has haste, so you get that creature down. Then you play get wrong from the command zone and just. Psh- chip in somebody someone's going to be able to take uh damage from a six five trampler on turn five or turn six and then not only are you drawing like six seven eight nine ten cards off of this thing but the fact that you get to put ten lands or however many lands onto the into play tapped there's no coming back from that once get rock triggers for one huge hit there's never you're never going to be able to stop get rock from continuously coming down for the rest of the game plus i love the order on that because you draw the cards first and then take the land so I could definitely see it being a little less powerful if it was the other way around, but this this is juicy. Yeah, this thing, it, it looks like it slaps. I think I'd be so scared to see this across the table. How many Golgari decks are, is BZ going to build from this set? Two? We, we, got, old, two? we, we got Rutstein, we got Gitrog. <laughs> let's, see, let's see if there's any more. <laughs> okay, so I checked and there's no more Golgari cards, uh, which is pretty sad. But number three, Rakdos the Muscle, two black, black, red, six, five, Flampler. Whenever you sacrifice another creature, exile cards equal to its mana value from the top of target player's library until your next end step. You may play those cards, and mana of any type can be spent to cast them. Sacrifice another creature, he gains indestructible until on a turn. Tap it only once each turn. Here, they're just throwing stipulations at you, so you got to remember that you can cast the cards until the end of your next turn, and you can only sacrifice something to make him indestructible once, and it does tap him. But that alone makes him really, really hard to kill because he basically has indestructible if someone tries to throw something at him. Plus, it's a free sack outlet, which can be so much value. Well, it's value because of yeah. himself. Because if you just sack a 4-4, you get to draw four cards, basically. I mean, BZ has always said something like, I hate the enabler with the payoff. This is that. And so this is definitely an example of that, which is why it's ranking so high on our power list. I guess it doesn't give you creatures, but that's all you got to figure out. Figure out... How to put creatures onto the battlefield, and you can just start stealing cards. You called this Rakdos Mill because you could potentially, you know, Combo. if you get, like, Phyrexian Dreadnoughts and stuff on the board, you could mill them out. Yeah, you technically can. I think that's really funny, actually. If you want to do Sakdos in a way that's original, unlike the way that I play it, I think that would be a very funny way to go. It's worth noting, in case you're evaluating Rakdos this way, you, you can only sacrifice a creature to make him indestructible once per turn, but that top ability is just whenever you sacrifice another creature. So if you've got, like, Altar of Dementia, forget the second part. Just start sacking your dudes and getting access to a bajillion cards. Their entire decks, even. Number two is a very simple card, but it's very strong. It's Gear Red, Mirror of the Wilds, red, white, green for a 3-3 haste. Non-token creatures you control have tap 
Create a token that's a copy of target token you control that entered the battlefield this turn. That's got some pretty powerful ramifications. That's so powerful. I love this. It can trigger immediately because it does have haste. And then whether you're making treasures or just big like worm coil engine tokens or whatever, it doesn't really matter because that's so much value. And then on the upper end of what this deck can do, you take a crappy card like Midnight Guard. Whenever another creature enters, it untaps. Now, as long as you make any creature token, this Midnight Guard can tap to make a copy of that creature token. It doesn't matter what it is. And then that creature entering will untap Midnight Guard, giving you access to another handful of basically splinter twins now gear it is not only like watch out guys they're going to get value it's no guys you have to kill it because they're going to annihilate you with infinite somethings is there any way we can make like non-legendary copies of kiki jiki or something probably but i don't know off the top of my head that doesn't really matter there's just <laughs> Gearhead has like five Kiki Jikis now in his deck. Yeah, I I think this is so spicy. This is going to be a kill on sight commander. It seriously is. They're gonna have all of those Kiki Jiki stuff in there too, making copies of like Village Bell Ringer, and it's like that alone is going infinite. But you also have to worry about the the Gearhead side of it. And Gearhead slaps. I love the one sentence menaces. But number one is the best card in this set by a mile. It's Stella Lee wild card. One red and a blue for a 2-4. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, exile the top card of your library until the end of your next turn, you can play that card. Sounds like a lot of other commanders, whatever. If you tap her, copy target instant or sorcery spell you control. You can choose new targets for the copy. Activate only if you've cast three or more spells this turn. Surprisingly easy in is it? Yes, copying spells at instant speed when you tap a creature I don't think that's really been done before without the once per turn clause. So they just kind of made a card that's like busted because if I cast a spell that untaps Stella Lee, uh, I can, as long as that's my third spell or later in the chain, I can now tap Stella Lee, make a copy of that untapper, which will resolve and untap her. And now there's still the original copy on uh, original card on the stack, which I can now do infinitely. So something like refocus will draw your entire deck, something like twisted fealty will create infinite uh, wicked rolls, which will die on Stella Lee, killing your opponents. And those are both just two cards. It's Stella Lee plus one spell plus any two spells before that in, in the game. This thing, it's almost like the first ability is great and it's nice and it fuels the second ability, but I, I can't even worry about it because I'm dead to that last ability all the time. It's so spicy. You want to give her haste. You want to make sure she does. She has hexproof but doesn't have shroud so you can actually target her to untap. But other than that, you know, the kind of the world's your oyster, right? Let's see how you build this wrong, you know? I think people are going to build this and put little upgrades and accidentally go infinite. They're going to say, oh, guys, I found this cool thing that can untap her so I can copy something later and then someone will point out Maybe me. No, you actually just win. It's so good. I can't believe they actually made a commander like this because I I feel like this is the card that they would be like to be like, guys, get back into magic again. Like we have really powerful stuff, but like they didn't need that. They already had spicy stuff from two to I don't know, like fifteen or something. But number one by a mile. Oh, Stella is fantastic. And if you want to know about those precons we kept alluding to, we review them all right here again from worst to best.